Frank Heider is a well-known, renowned visual artist. When he started to become an artist, he thought the journey would be a straightforward progression. Over the years, he has discovered that the road has many twists and turns, numerous hills and valleys, and countless challenges. Through this series of short stories, tales, and remembrances, his hope is that these will offer some valuable insight into the life of an artist and what's involved in becoming an artist. In the end, he has come to realize that he is not a painter, or sculptor, or anything in particular. He is more simply a creative person, with great passion and love for the process of making art concerning people and the world around us, who shares his artworks with the public. Join us now as we listen to another episode of A Life in Art series. Often people will approach me and ask me how I arrive at my images. And I really don't give that a lot of thought. Uh, I know some people search magazines or books or all sorts of references looking for their images. And I've just sort of trusted the idea that the images really kind of are just, I can find my images through rather ordinary things. Uh, I started my art career doing portraits of my uh, friends and associates in art school. And uh, the idea of, of portraits or heads uh, has been part of my work almost from the very beginning. Uh, but I also was very much interested in the notion uh, and from the very beginning of art school of painting the human figure. I, I saw the human figure as almost a, a form that had moved through the history of art so that you could look at the standing figures painted by the Greeks or by the statues of the Egyptians and you could get a, it was as if they were kind of doorways or mandolas into those cultures and into their their society and it it was a way of sort of entering that world so i i worked with that notion that the figure was in fact uh a, a mandola something you step through uh and when i went to the skowhegan school uh i was confronted by the presence of nature up to that point landscape had been something that i hadn't really given the depth of thought that I think it really deserved. And the relationship that I had to the landscape was underdeveloped as well. But at Skowhegan, it became a focus. So the entire time that I was at Skowhegan, I abandoned painting the figure and focused really very intensely on the idea of trying to understand the landscape as a, as a viable form or as a way of making an image. So I started out with uh, sort of traditional vistas and uh, scenarios of being in a forest looking towards a clearing or vice versa, etc. And gradually, uh, I began to approach the, the image of making a landscape as being um, a, a much less uh, a spatial component as more a symbolic component. So at the end of my time at Skowhegan, I was painting these really large surface treatments with a lot of subtlety reflecting sky and other things in the surface of ponds with an occasional leaf or water lily on the surface to define that space. And uh, of course, when you enter a kind of image like that, you're confronted by images by Monet and uh, the whole notion of the French Impressionist approach to painting. Uh, and at the same time, I, I was really getting quite a lot out of those paintings. So when I came back to Philadelphia, my focus was on trying to figure out a way to combine those two images. Um, they all came to rest in a single painting, which I, I called Lisa in Wonderland, in which I painted uh, a standing figure in front of a painting of a of an enormous painting of a pond surface with reflection on the pond surface, and yet 
the painting was clearly a painting hung on the wall. I painted the wall. I painted the baseboard. I painted paint drips on the floor. And so there was this sense of the figure in front of this painting. And I, I was really trying to create some kind of tension between the landscape and the figure that expressed a deeper connection than just a woman standing in front of a painting. I wanted to have something more to it. Uh, those images, as I left art school and went to New York, eventually evolved into uh, a painting of a woman standing on a high diving board at a preposterous height, hundreds of feet above the swimming pool. And below her, uh, I first started with an uh, like a circular pool, and then I eventually evolved into painting a star-shaped swimming pool. So it was as if my my figure was standing in front of a pool that represented the United States. And in that pool and around the pool, I filled it with hundreds of small figures of with different references to racial types and physical body types, etc. And I used it in a, you know, I'm thinking lo rather loosely about a contemporary way of looking at Hieronymus Bosch or an artist like that. And those paintings began to uh, really... Uh, create a pathway for me to find my own voice and my own way of conceiving of a painting. As I move through uh, time and my, my, bro my approach to painting broadened and I began to become more of a mixed media artist, I found myself incorporating uh, these figure in front of the landscape as a model, but uh, incorporating it in different formats. So uh, as I began to make images of sort of planets or big waves, I would put a figure that stood in front of that, um, and that figure would represent that figure that I was interested in from Lisa in Wonderland time and kept moving forward. Uh, eventually, uh, the, the Philadelphia Museum acquired a painting of mine in which there's a kind of a, a landscape, which is an ocean-like image uh, that is has a figure wrapped in towels standing in front of it. And uh, the, that tension that Lisa in Wonderland was seeking to create, that this, this piece really delivers on that. And as I moved in, got more and more involved in paintings, that were carved and assembled, uh, I began to make these large diptychs that were closed paintings in the manner of Hieronymus Bosch, and then they opened. And the format was they were eight feet square when they were closed, and they were eight by 16 feet when they were opened. And each of those, uh, again, had a standing figure in the middle of the painting, dead center up in the front, with this landscape imaginary landscape occurring behind them. So as a format and as a an approach to conceiving of a painting, my desire was to integrate the figure into the landscape. Um, I, I did a little bit of a break with that when I, I began a series of images which I refer to as the frontier. And I wanted to give that sense of being right on the edge between two worlds. And I was feeling, after all of my experiences in Latin America, and now I was living in Miami, I really felt like I was on a frontier of kind, and I was in a frontier of a kind. And so I came up with the idea of painting the landscape in black and white, and then adding a face into the landscape in full color so that they were clearly out of balance, again, trying to draw attention to that idea that the figure in front of the landscape has some connection to the landscape, which is more than just casual. There's a dynamic between them. So those images began to have uh, a real impact on, on how I approached the painting. So what I would get to do was I would begin to paint uh, three or four faces on paper or on canvas, then I would cut them out 
and randomly shape their the cuts so they were not square or rectangular or oval but rather rather irregular and then i would glue them on to the surface and then paint the landscape in black and white without any design at all in a totally improvisational way so and for me it was a little bit like um I was, I was giving myself a starting point and then improvising and how the improvisation would take place is those initial cuts that I made into the head would generate the shape of elements of the landscape coming up against the sides of the faces and then they would migrate out from there. And so I would incorporate images in my memory that I saw in my morning walk along the edge of the beach or uh, uh, walking through a park and I, I would just come back with an image in my memory of something and begin to build that into the painting. So I had no idea what these paintings would look like when I finished. I just had the idea of starting with the figure Figure and then filling the landscape in. And in my mind, I had actually kind of merged the two images, which I started 30 years earlier by putting one in front of the other. Now I was actually connecting them in a, a kind of uh, synergy, which had not existed in the earlier work. Um, they formerly always were connected from the way the images were made, but now they were locking together in a new way of uh, color versus non-color or black and white. And I, I felt that I was connecting the landscape in a way that was more true to the way I saw the disconnect in the world. You know, I'm, we're living in a world where uh, they just plow down trees and build a building and no one thinks about the effect on the environment. No one's really thinking about uh, the space beyond the piece of ground that they own. They're not really, you know, there's, there's uh, all kinds of threats to the environment. And uh, at least these paintings, which I refer to as a frontier, begin to uh, just make an image that will make a statement that reminds one of that. You know, I don't know that paintings can really solve a problem. I think at the very most, uh, paintings are something that can illuminate a problem. Or as Picasso once said, you know, art is not truth. Art is a lie that helps us see the truth. And um, I, I think that statement is, is generally really very true. So I'm, I'm less interested in creating an image that I have in my mind before I start the painting, I'm far more interested in leaving the painting with an image that I've gotten off of my mind and put in other people's minds as I leave the painting. Thank you for listening. If you have questions or suggestions for future episodes, please reach out to Frank Heider on Facebook or Instagram. We hope to see you at one of the next A Life in Art episodes.